Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is your inspired word, that none of us, although we are not worthy uh, to open it, we are not worthy to get to know you, we're not, not worthy of your love, uh, we can't do anything to deserve it and to earn it, and yet you've chosen to, to love us, to reveal to us the mystery of the good news about Jesus who died for our sins and rose for our joy if we believe in him. And we thank you, we pray now, uh, that you would give us precisely what you know in your infinite wisdom that we need, uh, whether it's encouragement or challenge, uh, rebuke, or comfort. Will you give to us, as we speak from your word, by your spirit, what we need, wherever we're at spiritually. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was a good amen from the back there. That's fantastic. That was really good. Was that Tino? I'm not sure. Um, how, how, how did you, well, with my daughter, that's beautiful, isn't it? Um, how, I'm, not, I'm not paying her. Uh, how did you end up with the name that you have? How did you end up with the name that you have? Does it mean anything, your name? I wonder. Okay, um, I was trying to find out from people from the church and elsewhere how they name their children. And it's utterly fascinating, fascinating. And there are things I can't say in public. Um, what other people are naming their babies, guides, what you name your baby. If everyone is calling their baby, you know, I don't know, Julie, then you go, oh, I don't know, that's not unique enough. You know, so that could, that could guide what you call your baby. Maybe the length of the name, what the name sounds like, whether the name of the child would affect their future job prospects. <laughs> okay. Um, what the ability of the child will be to pronounce their name. And I, I'm going to refrain from giving you examples that, when mispronounced, sound like swear words. Um, when the child can't pronounce certain letters. Uh, I shouldn't have said that because now I know the youth will come and ask me what the... Anyway, what we don't normally do is we don't pick a name based on the circumstances of the birth of the child. And because we don't know the future of the child, we don't pick a name that says what the future will be. However, some of you have hopes. For example, you saw John here. He was leading the service. His daughter is a defender of men. Lexi. Brave. Amazing. You know? And yet, she's also joy. Isn't she? Look at that. Unflinchingly. You see, in our story, in our historical moment, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, we find the father's joy. Abigail. Father's joy. Woman that is joyful. Interesting, the cause of joy for other people. We find David, the beloved, or the favorite. We find Nabal, which can mean man of Carmel, but it sounds like the adjective senseless, foolish. And it's in the life of Abigail that we're going to see a humility that brings peace as we follow on episode number two of our series, Messy Lives. Last time we talked about Elkanah, uh, and it was great, and we talked about the man the mess, and the Messiah. And I was very tempted to say that today, as we have uh, the messy life of a woman, that perhaps we should say the woman, the bigger mess, the Messiah. But then I had to actually read the Bible, and unfortunately, she's actually pretty amazing, so I couldn't do that. She's pretty amazing. I shouldn't say unfortunately. But you remember from last time that when we opened the books of Samuel, we see that there are lots of interesting themes there. We see that the theme of family and power is there because everything that happens with the family of Saul or the family of David affects the life of the whole nation. So family is very important, and that fitted in really well with what was going on in the life of Elkanah. Uh, but in our immediate context, if you were to flick over, because you have a Bible open in front of you, don't you? Because you love the Bible. That's why you have it turned on, or that's why you want to get it turned on on your, on your lap if it's a phone, um, or if it's a book on your lap now. But if you were to go to chapter 25, 24, you would know that David is on the run because Saul is not accepting the fact that God has chosen David to be king of Israel. So he's tried to kill him, and he still wants him dead, and so he's in the wilderness, in the place of testing. And we're going to see lots of parallels with Jesus, but not through David, through Abigail. So let's begin by talking about the woman. And where is my clicker? Here it is. So, what do these people have in common? Okay? 
Uh, here is someone who is about to do what? Sing? Yeah? Here's someone who's about to... To clean? Um, and then here's a woman. What do they have in common? I would challenge you and say, they are fairly unassuming people. Um, what genre of music was this girl going to sing? Opera. How incredibly unpredictable, right? How unexpected. Uh, this cleaner would turn out to uh, go into several gyms. Uh, he's actually a professional powerlifter, and he effortlessly lifts, uh, say, 250, 300 kilos, moves it around so he can mop the floor. Very amazing. Uh, here, what's unassuming? Well, she's a woman. We're not going to expect anything extraordinary from a woman, are we? If we were in the ancient world, people, don't shoot me yet. You've got to inhabit the world of the Bible. Otherwise, what we say doesn't make sense. And you go, well, the Bible doesn't make sense. It was because we are in a culture that's far removed from what was going on here. Abigail, in our passage, starts, verse 3, as simply, who is she? There's a certain man, and we hear that he's wealthy, and he's got a thousand of this, three thousand of that. Verse 3, his name is Nabal. I'm going to call him Nabal. You can call him Nabal. And his wife's name was Abigail. Who is Abigail? She's somebody's wife. She's somebody's wife. But quickly, we find, as we look at the life of this woman, she is head and shoulders above the rest. Which, by the way, is an expression that comes from the books of Samuel, head and shoulders above the rest. So what do we first find out about her? Look at verse 3 and see with me. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a killer by. She was an intelligent woman. Now already we've got to pause and think here. A lot of people that don't understand the Bible or don't read the Bible would say that just like all the other products of literature from the ancient world, the Bible doesn't like women, hates women, or puts women down. But I actually, moments like this in the history of the Bible remind us that the Bible actually elevates women. Because what we are going to see is her intelligence in action, which amounts to wisdom. And therefore, we're going to be in awe of how God has equipped this woman it's not what you expect when people say, oh, the Bible is misogynistic. Not this Bible. So look at her intelligence. Um, you've just had read the story, uh, heard the story read uh, expertly, if I might say, um, by our young people. Um, and our not-so-young people. Obviously, I mean me. Um, not so young. But um, in the middle of this historical narrative, Abigail is dropped into a tough situation between two angry men. Look at verse 14. One of the servants told Abigail, um, Nabal's wife, David sent messages from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They didn't ill-treat us, and the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us, a wall of protection. Now think it over, verse 17, and see what you can do. Because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. So, here is a woman who is wealthy. And a servant, who is a nobody really, comes to tell her almost what to do. And she is intelligent enough to read the whole situation and say, I will listen. And she is intelligent enough that in verse 18... She will act quickly. She understands the gravity of the situation. She comes up with a plan that is clever. And by the time we get to the end of the story, verse 33, David is saying, man, this woman has acted with good judgment. Everyone is impressed by her. She's intelligent enough to read her husband well, so that in verse 19, what does she not do? She knows He's a surly, mean dude. His life is in danger. She doesn't tell him the plan. 
He would ruin it. In verse 25, look at it with me. She doesn't pretend something. Please pay no attention, she says to David, my lord, to the wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool and folly goes with him. <clears throat> just because this guy is family, she's not pretending he's not a fool. She's being honest. And yet, she's being matter of fact. She's not just being disparaging. Do you remember that verse in Proverbs chapter 26 uh, where, it, where it reads, Answer a fool according to his folly. And then the next verse says, verse 5, uh, Proverbs 26, Don't answer a fool according to his folly. This woman is so intelligent, so wise, she knows when to do both. Because to her husband at this moment, he's a fool, don't answer him. He's not going to listen. She's going to mess him even more. But to David, he's also acting like a fool, but she knows that she can answer him and answer him with God's word. She's intelligent enough to have God's name on her lips. How amazing. Verse 28. What does she have to say? to David. You're going to see why we want to apply this to our lives today. Look at verse 28. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles. You look at verse 29, right in the middle of it. The life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 30, when the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing, and towards the end there, and when the Lord your God has brought my Lord success, remember your servant. This woman, who is intelligent, is married to a fool, has the Lord's name on her lips, and it's able to move David's eyes from his sword that wants to kill, to the Lord, his God. What incredible intelligence, what incredible wisdom. I wonder, already if we pause here, isn't that the job of the church? Isn't Abigail being exactly what we ought to be with one another? Pointing one another to the promises of God. She's saying, hey David, God has promised that you'll be king. Don't shed innocent blood so that you won't be an evil king. Remember God's promise to you. She is pointing to the promises of God. Perhaps, I wonder, we need to be doing this with each other overtly, intentionally, openly, as Abigail does it. And maybe it will be things like, hey, maybe you need to hear today the promise of God is that if you belong to Him, He's going to give you all that you need for every trial. Maybe that He's going to provide a way out in the middle of temptation, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Maybe that he will give us what we need for life and godliness, as the Apostle Paul says. Maybe that when we are anxious, he has our future in his hands. We need to be pointing to each other the promises of God and lifting our eyes from whatever it is, if it's David, from the anger, from the frustration, from the anxiety, from the sorrow and grief, pointing each other's eyes to the Lord. Because what's remarkable is, as we discuss Abigail the woman, this intelligent woman, she lived as if God's promises are actually real, tangible, certain. She just believed David would be king because God said it. So I wonder, do we live lives that are based on God's promises? Do we do that when we open the Bible privately? when we come to a home group and we get to encourage each other in that way, at youth group and you're listening attentively, in a one-to-one -one meeting and before that meeting you've done your homework and you've uh, come to the Bible uh, ready, and so on. But she's also, a very short point, a beautiful woman. I remember that I was very fixated on beauty uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a teenager and I just, it, it had a, a physical reaction to me. If I was before a, a beautiful girl at school, I just, I lost the words. I just couldn't speak. I, di I didn't think they could do anything wrong. It was very impactful. 
Um, later, as I was growing um, in the same school, and I, I looked at those uh, beautiful, absolutely stunning, stunning girls, um, and something I, I began to notice. Often, some of the really, I say some, of the really beautiful girls had no depth of character. They, di they didn't need to because all of us stupid boys would just, they didn't have to ask, and we would just say, yeah, what would you like? <laughs> you know? It, so they didn't have to work on it. Obviously, there were pleasantly always exceptions, always exceptions. But here's what's amazing. First, we hear that she is intelligent. Then we hear that she is beautiful. She is a woman of great beauty, yes? But normally, a woman that might be stunningly beautiful and knows that she is stunningly beautiful might not be humble. And that's the next thing that we are surprised by. Abigail not only is intelligent and beautiful, she is humble. Humility is the keynote in the music that we hear of Abigail's life. Look at the story with me. Kids, this is the bit where you have to order the pictures that are in your handouts. Okay? So, just recall what's happened with me. David and his men are hiding from King Saul. He wants to kill him. They take refuge in the wilderness of Paran. In that area lives a man who probably was as large as this man, who knows, called Nabal. Nabal's many servants, uh, he had many servants, he owned thousands of sheep, hundreds of goats, and David's men helped to protect his herdsmen, protecting his flocks from other raiders, maybe from wolves, from wild animals. And after a while, spent uh, uh, guarding the flocks, David sent men to ask Nabal for some food. He told his messengers to be polite, uh, and how well they protected uh, Nabal's flocks, and so on. But Nabal was so greedy, so selfish, he wouldn't share his food with David and his men. He lost his temper. He replied in anger. He insulted David. He was going to give him evil for good. The messengers reported back to David, and now it was David's turn to be angry. Let's kill him all. But Nabal's wife, Abigail, heard about her husband's rudeness. She was a very wise woman and wanted to stop the fight, protect her husband, even though he didn't deserve it. So without her husband's knowing, she loads up the donkeys, huge supply of food, sets off to meet David, meets David and his angry men who are marching towards Nabal's house, ready to teach him a lesson. But she falls on her knees. And I mean, it, it, it's face to ground here, face to the ground pleading with him to take the gift and spare her husband's life, David suddenly sees sense and says, Blessed be the God that made things so that you could come and speak to me, stopping me from doing something very stupid. Took the gift, went back to his hideout. Abigail goes home where she sees her husband feasting, waits for the next day when he's sobered up, told him what she had done, how close he had come to dying by the hands of David and all the gifts she had given. And for one reason or the other, he was so alarmed. He had a heart attack or a stroke, couldn't move for 10 days, and then the Lord killed him. When David heard that, he says, Abigail, will you marry me? Well, what was humble? I wonder if kids, if you've got all the pictures in the order there. What was humble about Abigail? in that way well her first instinct was to respond with a gift of apology i'll tell you now if i'm in a sticky situation if there's angry people around me it is not my first instinct to think how i can pacify people around me it is not verse 23 her face to the ground is there any more humbling or humiliating position than this There isn't, is there? Because in the ancient world, if someone's not having it, they can kick you from that position. They can humiliate you even more. This woman is a, is a diplomat between two angry men. And instead of saying, calm down, everyone. Has anyone ever said that to you? Does that work? Does it work? It doesn't work on my children. It doesn't work on my wife. It's never worked on a pastoral conversation. 
So I just need to learn my lesson and stop doing it. But instead, she puts herself not only in that low position, but she says repeatedly, David, I'm your servant. She knew her place before God and she subjected herself to God's will for the sake of peace. I wonder, are we challenged to resolve our problems in this way, with humility? Here's why I say that. Everything that's in the Scriptures points to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see that when we get to our third point. But already, Abigail would have known the God of the Old Testament is a God who is patient. Patient with Israel. Doesn't destroy and judge them quickly. He waits Uh, He takes on a bunch of abuse uh, from the people of God as they worship a golden calf here, as they worship the gods of another nation there. This is what God does with us. He condescends to our level like an adult kneeling down to speak to a child patiently. And we want to reflect that humility because later we find that's the humility that enabled the Son of God to leave his eternal place, to take on flesh and become a man, that takes humility. But let's talk about, that's the woman, let's talk about the mess. Have you ever met a couple where you you look at the woman and you go, wow, wow, she is beautiful. Um, she's very intelligent. She's got a, a, a way with words, maybe. Uh, maybe just very skilled in what she does for a living. You know, something impressive uh, about that woman. And in, while you're pondering that, and you're just thinking about that, because you're just about to meet this couple, you sort of gaze, and you go, Is this your husband? But you, but you, him, you, him, you, him. Has this happened to you? You know, perhaps if you're a child, you're going, yes, look at my dad. (laughs) Look at my mom, it's fantastic. My dad looks like a train wreck. This is what's interesting. Abigail... It's in here in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Later, okay, her name appears in Chronicles. You know, somehow we hear that she's even kidnapped um, by some of the ungodly peoples uh, of the Canaanite nations. I think it was the Amalekites. We don't ever hear anything really bad about her. When we were talking about Elkanah, I mean, the dude was, a, he was in a polygamous relationship. He had bowed down to his culture. We don't hear anything bad about her. Um, Abigail, so what is her mess? What is it? Her husband. Her husband. So maybe it was the case, you know, that she married him when he was a God-fearing man, and then he turned out to abandon the faith he believed. Maybe she had no choice and it was an arranged marriage, because that was the deal of the day. Regardless of that, for how many of us the biggest mess in our lives, perhaps in your life, isn't anything you've done. It's something someone else has done. How many of us wouldn't either give up or give in if you were in her shoes? I mean, I can just imagine. I would have said, David, here's all the money, here's all the gifts. Listen, he did all this. It wasn't me. If you're going to kill him, if you just kill him, take whatever you want. Marry me, actually, as well. You can protect me. But no, she responded with honesty and yet without hostility. That was a very poor choice of uh, font there, wasn't it? Honesty without hostility. Look at verse 25 when she says, Pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. Is it true he's wicked? She's being truthful. He's just like his name. His name means fool and folly goes with him. And yet, she is fighting for his life. She's fighting so that this war will turn into peace. Shouldn't we be equally able to be truthful while lovingly working 
for the good of other people. Even if, like Nabal, he's got no idea what's he doing, getting drunk while she's saving his life. Now, I wonder if, as we're challenged by this, she never met Jesus, but isn't she doing this? But I tell you, Jesus says in Matthew 5, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. She's doing more than praying. She's actually really, truly loving him and working for his good that you may be children of your Father in heaven. That's very much what Abigail is showing herself to be. The Father's joy, but God the Father's joy. As we finish this little section in the middle of the mess, is there anybody that God is placing in your mind, in your heart, who maybe is the mess in your life? that you are challenged to ask the Lord, help me to be patient, to work for their good, even though they're not thinking of me, they're never going to say thanks. But like Abigail, and like the God she worships, I will work for their good. I wonder if there's anybody like that. But let's move on to a joyful moment. The woman, oh, I don't know what's happened there. The woman, the mess, the Messiah. Abigail is really like a big signpost, okay? And as I just mentioned to you, a verse that says, her works show her father. We do know the children. We do know the the parents by knowing the children a little bit, don't we? That's one of the greatest joys of my youth work, is to be able to, even before I met the parents, if I've had the kids come into my youth club or to Kids Friday Club, I immediately can pick out the parents and... I immediately can pick out certain family mannerisms, ways of doing things that just betray who they belong to. See, some of you are smiling to yourselves now because you're thinking, what is it about my family that would do? There's always something. There's always something. And in that way, the children are a bit of a signpost to their parents, aren't they? I don't want you to believe this when you see my children misbehaving. I want you to believe that nobody's perfect, and not that the children are a signpost. But for the sake of this illustration, she is like a big signpost saying, look over here. And she is pointing to Jesus. Now, if you were to, in any other translation than the NIV, look at verse 24, you would see this, that Abigail says, even in the uh, NIV 1984, she's a type of Christ when she says this, David, I accept all the guilt. She did nothing wrong, this woman. The very first thing that she says to David is, I take all the guilt. Let me explain to you. The NLT, the New English Translation, the International Children's Bible, even the Message, the English Standard Version, the King James Version, they all say some version of, I take this iniquity upon myself. And she is putting her life on the line, isn't she? Even though she's done nothing wrong. David, she doesn't know what what David, the madman at this point, is going to do. He could have killed her. This is just what Jesus Christ does for us. Again and again, she uses the language of, I'm your servant. That's what Jesus has done. Philippians chapter 2, humbled himself, taking the nature of a servant, being obedient to death, There's lots of other parallels. Look at it with me. Because as I list each of these things, if you're a Christian, this makes you grateful that Jesus is like this. He's he's like a better Abigail. Have you ever thought about this? In Psalm 27, um, David says, here's what I want to do the most. I want to be in God's temple, and I want to gaze at his beauty. At his beauty. But at this point, there's no incarnate Jesus. So, How is God beautiful if he doesn't have a body? It's not because his ears are symmetrical. It's not because he works out and he's got a six-pack. No. His beauty is because of his perfect and loving and wonderful, merciful, just character. Abigail was beautiful, and we see her beauty in her character. We look at the Lord Jesus. He is the supremely beautiful one whose perfect character never disappoints. Abigail was really resourceful, wasn't she? 
She read the situation. She was like, okay, here's what we need to do. Servants, you get this many sheep. You get this many days. Right, you go ahead of me. I'm going to go right behind you. She's rehearsing the speech. She's really resourceful. Jesus is the ultimate resourcefully wise man whose teaching is with authority, whose words are always um, assaulted with the wisdom of God. And when Abigail says, I'm ready to take on your wrath, David, well, guess what Jesus does? He takes on the wrath of God the Father on sin for anybody who believes. But here's a sobering thing, verse 38. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. The dude who just wouldn't listen. I mean, he was married to this intelligent woman. I guess he just wouldn't listen. Well, what was his end? The Lord killed him. And if you've been following our journey through the book of Revelation... Uh, and if you come tonight, our next installment is to cover why on earth there is a prostitute uh, sitting on a beast with seven heads, ten horns, uh, sitting on many waters. Come tonight and find out what's going on there. But in the book of Revelation, the wrath of God falls on those who have had every chance to repent. They've had lots of Abigails in their lives teaching them about Jesus' um, uh, offer of free forgiveness, how he died for their sins, how he rose again to show it's all true. And they just said, I don't want it. And like Nabal the fool, because they are foolish not to believe the gospel, they will die. But a spiritual death that is separation from God. So listen to this. Jesus died while you and I weren't even aware of God, even thinking about him. We couldn't care less. Just as Abigail was saving Nabal's life and he didn't know about it, That makes us grateful. So if you're wowed by Abigail's intelligence, her beauty, her humility, her honesty without hostility, if you're wowed by that, be wowed by Jesus, the Son of God. This makes you run to him with your face to the ground, falling at his feet, worshiping him. If you're not someone who's done that for the first time yet, maybe you're a young person here, maybe you're an older person here, and you've not made that decision to repent of your sin, to say, sorry, Jesus, I, I'm a fool like Nabal. I need to come to you and say, forgive me. If you've not done that, do that today. And the result that we see here will be the same. David says, go home in peace. In Romans 5.1 says, if you trust in Jesus, we have peace with God. No more war. No more fear. And lastly, let me tell you this. Uh, this generation now, younger than me, um, they hate reading, okay? For, for the most part, they just don't like reading too much. Um, and so they look at the Old Testament and they go, man, this is hard. It's hard, this. There's like all sorts of crazy things. And if they ever make it past Leviticus, you know, watch our sermon series on this. Um, if they uh, make it past Leviticus, and they've uh, gone past all of the you know, sacrifices and blood and semen and all sorts of other things there in Leviticus, um, they just don't even know what connection a book like Samuel or Kings or Judges might have with Jesus. If you put the work in and you do what we've done here this morning and you see through Abigail a Messiah that is to come, you get excited about it and you love the Word of God and you see that just like it's happened here, perhaps even today, you want to do something so stupid, so stupid, maybe in anger. And the same God that organized all of this to stay the hand of David often arranges events in our lives, if we belong to him, to stop us from doing some stupid stuff. And we are grateful to him. We are grateful for the Abigails in our lives that God uses to open our eyes to our own ways. So, there you have it. The woman, the mess, the Messiah. Let's pray before we sing again.
Lord Jesus, we are so thankful to you that you, you show us how this stuff is true, how you want us to walk with you, walk closely with you. And we are sorry that often the Abigail in our life is really just us coming uh, to your word and choosing to obey or to disobey. Would you help us? Help us to, like her, be intelligent enough to know our lives are before your throne. And so we need to look at your word. Help us to be wise and intelligent enough to point each other to you, to the promises that you have made, to the warnings that you have given, to your word. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that this is what you have done for us. You've sacrificed everything. Father, how will you not, along with him, give us all things? We worship you and we thank you. Help us to, even after this uh, morning service, encourage each other with these words. Amen.